and then later Baikonov comes to Lenin and tells him that he's had suicidal thoughts because of their fighting, and at that time, now Lenin is unsympathetic. And, um, so they seem to have this, uh, this relationship that is very personal, and there's a lot of infighting. And Plankinov is asked to denounce Lenin at the Congress. And um, Plankinov makes this really emotional, rousing speech um, where he refers to his relationship with Lenin as a marriage, actually, and it surprises Lenin. Um, <clears throat> and Plankinov tells this story about Napoleon, and he says, Napoleon uh, asked his officers to divorce their wives, even though they loved their wives very much, perhaps. Um, he asked them to divorce them and to uh, devote themselves to the task at hand, and he said, but I will never divorce Lenin. So they, they tried to present a united front uh, to the party. Uh, this will become even more strained, their relationship as time goes on, though. Um, so the Jewish Bund walks out, Bund walks out of the Second Party Congress. Um, and it's not clear to me what the, this is something I want to research more. Uh, I've, heard, I've read conflicting accounts of what the Jewish Bund actually was requesting at the Party Congress. Um, one source says that they demanded um, to be the sole governing representative for all Jewish Russian Marxists. Um, and Lenin and Plankinov and others uh, will not go along with this. And they feel like um, that they should not be setting uh, or um, allowing factions within the party. They want one party for one proletariat class and they don't want to start allowing exceptions for different ethnicities um, or different factions. And they feel that would be counterproductive. Um, and so the, the Jewish blood walks out. Um, <clears throat> and again, that could be another point of departure that we could discuss if we want to. Um, today we have, uh, I think we refer to minoritarian politics or consensus building, um, anarchism versus communism, um, and degrees of autonomy within collective um, uh, bargaining congresses. So we can talk about all these things. Uh, and, and I feel like a lot of these, these events that occurred um, kind of, I think, laid groundwork for a lot of discussions that we're still having today in 2010. Um, he also, Lennon also talks about his book, What is to be Done, at the Second Party Congress. And this was the book that was the reading group discussion maybe two months ago, that Chris led. And um, he, uh, this is interesting to me, maybe you can like jump in here if you want to. Um, Lennon admits polemical excess in the book at the Second Party Congress. <laughs> and he explains it thus, he says, quote, nowadays all of us know the economists bent the stick in one direction. To straighten the stick out, it had to be bent in the opposite direction. This is what I did. And by the economists, he's kind of referring to the trade unionists and the syndicalists. Um, and so he, he does admit political excess and um, almost apologizes for it, but uh, actually explains where he's coming from and why he did that. Um, at this uh, party congress is the, f the famous formation of the Mensheviks and the Bolshevik factions. And I'll explain how that kind of happened and how that was also controversial for several reasons. Um, so Lenin feels, uh, Lenin feels like increasingly Plekhanov is just serving a role that is kind of a uh, figurehead role that he um, gives their proceedings like an air of a bona fide, um, you know, Plankinov agrees with it, then other Marxists can agree with it. But he feels like secretly Plankinov is really not making much of a contribution. Um, and so uh, he wants to oust Plankinov um, from uh, a central committee is formed and a, and a newspaper editorial board is formed. The newspaper is called the Nisikra. And Plekhanov and Lenin are on the editorial board, and they're in charge of um, disseminating uh, articles and propaganda throughout uh, the Russian Empire and throughout the immigre um, locales as well. And uh, Plekhanov and Lenin are continually fighting. And so, let me make sure I say this right. So Lenin has a friend named Martov, and they're both on the editorial board with Plekhanov. And Lenin comes to Martov. Uh, behind closed doors, and he says, I would like to reduce the editorial board from six party members down to three. 
and then what they may even play it on, we can outvote play it on whenever we uh, disagree with them. And the first Martov is on board, and Lynn is going to make a motion for this at the second party of Congress. Um, but uh, as the party of Congress uh, proceeds, Lennon and Martov start disagreeing on specifically how party membership will be comprised. And, and then their disagreements grow from there. Um, Martov wanted a little more autonomy in party membership, and it had to do with um, the authority vested in party members, um, whether they had to. Um, um, Lenin wanted every action done by a party member in the name of the party to be approved um, the, for there to be a chain of command. I, I think that's a simple way to say it. Martov also wanted this, but he wanted a looser chain of command. And he wanted a little more flexibility. Um, and the difference, actually, between the two probably might actually seem smaller to us than it seemed to them at the time. But they, um, they their disagreements grow and grow and <clears throat> at the second party Congress. And Lenin um, has the majority of the supporters on his side, so he names those supporters the Bolsheviks, and that just means uh, majoritarians or the majority. And he uh, nicknames Martov's followers the Mensheviks, which just means the minority. And uh, Martov takes this name uh, and runs with it. Um, but Martov feels like he's been um, kind of bested the Second Party Congress, and he realizes that he's in the minority. Um, and so after the Second Party Congress, <clears throat> a few months later, there's a Foreign League of Russian Revolutionary Social Democracy. There's the Foreign League of Russian Revolutionary Social Democracy. This is three months after the Second Party Congress. It's the first time that everybody's met together after the walkouts, after the almost fist fight, after the schism between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. And by no means are any of these uh, disputes solved, and so it's kind of like round two. And uh, Martov um, wants to uh, increase his upper hand at this this meeting three months later, and so he gets up to the podium and he, he tells the story. Uh, he he tells about the conversation that Lenin had with him privately about trying to reduce the editorial board from six members to three so they get out of the and people are aghast because, as I said, Plekhanov is this kind of sacred cow within uh, the Marxist movement. Um, let me just read this real fast. Because this is where Lenin falls out of favor, actually. It falls out and will become marginalized for about the next two years within the party. <clears throat> Uh, in the course of a lengthy speech, Martov revealed to uh, those assembled that Lenin was disingenuous in forming an alliance with Plekhanov. Before the Congress, Lenin had said to Martov, quote, don't you see that if you and I stick together, we'll keep Plekhanov permanently in a minority, and there'll be nothing he'll be able to do about it, end quote. Uh, as Martov says this to the assemblage, uh, Lenin makes for the door, slamming it after him. Plankinov, who had been listening impassively, announced he was willing to step down in order to put it into factional strife, following which uh, Lenin felt so disarmed by the events that he sent him in his own resignation. And so at this point, uh, Lenin is no longer in an in a, um, executive position within the party. And he, like I said, he'll be marginalized for the next almost two years. Um, But Lenin starts to regret his resignation. And he asks his friend Gleb, who has been elected to the Central Committee, to co-opt Lenin, a chair in the committee. And Gleb does, and the committee agrees to it. But um, this further um, divides the party, and the Mensheviks are crying foul play, and they're saying that all of these positions were democratically elected at the Congress, except for Lenin now, who's asked to be given a chair after the fact, and is kind of appointed to the position. And so this also leads to Lenin. Uh, he does get the he does get the position, but he's 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 kind of marginalized during that time to um, uh, pamphlet writing, which actually uh, he writes some amazing things. But um, 